Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. It's Wednesday, so it's time for another midweek mini mail call, and I'm actually gonna try to keep it mini this week. I know that never happens, but I promise that it's actually gonna be mini. I'll know after I edit the video. So anyhow, without further ado, let's get right to it. All right, we have a package here from Foon, and he's in Milpitas, California. So that's from the Bay Area. Hi to all my Bay Area viewers. Foon has sent stuff in before. It is TI-99 stuff in this box, and I'm pretty sure that's what he has sent in in the past. And yeah, wow, look at this. Okay, set of TI-99 joysticks. Not very good, those joysticks, but hey, Oh, look, okay, another power supply. That's great, actually. Believe it or not, <laughs> I have quite a number of TI-99s now, just like various stages of working, not working. I have one power supply, that's it. And I'm talking about the external brick here. A random floppy disk. TI-99 RF shield, you know, my favorite thing that there is, RF shields. Some more parts of an RF modulator switch box. All right, we have a TI-99 motherboard, but uh, the video chip is not in here, but that's fine. And, and then we have here another TI-99 motherboard, but this is the later version from the beige ones. And the last thing in the box is a power supply. This is the internal power supply module on the TI-99. This plugs into the brick in the, to the back of the computer. Oh, and the last thing is the cartridge port riser. This goes in the motherboard and is a right angle for the for the cartridge. Okay, and um, and there's this sticker here, which I think was actually probably on this disc, and it says from Foon. Disc contains a surprise. All right, I'll stick this label back on here, and we'll have to take a look at this disc. All right, very cool. Thank you very much for that. Let's take a look at this TI-99 stuff on the bench. All right, TI-99 stuff. Let's start with these joysticks. <laughs> Have you ever tried one of these things before? These TI-99 joysticks? They're an abomination. They are honestly the worst joystick I've ever felt. I mean, okay, so, let's see. First of all, the button, it's mushy, has no click action whatsoever. It's very stiff. So pushing it, it just is incredibly unsatisfying. And then the stick part of the joystick, well, it works, but it's very stiff. And um, even when you put it on the table and I push to the right or the left, the thing tilts over. I don't know, just overall pretty bad. I think what I intend to do with these, and I actually have another set floating around in the basement. I was just looking over, over there to see if they were hanging on the shelves and they're not, but I, I put them somewhere. Uh, the TI uses the weird connector. Well, it's it's a standard connector, but both joysticks connect to the single connector. So what I want to do is cut these off, put on two standard uh, DB9 type connectors so I can use even an Atari joystick, which people know I don't love, is million times better than these things. But I can also use the D-pads, all my um, D-pads that are compatible with the Commodore 64 and Atari and stuff like that will obviously work. I think you need a little diode action to make that happen. There are plans online to, to, to do that. But since this is just a nice molded cable, I can cut this, put two pigtails, and I do appreciate you sending these, Foon, but I think, yeah, I will not be playing anything on these. Although, maybe that would be a fun torture test. Like, torturing me, in other words. Play Parsec with these, try to complete a certain number of levels. <laughs> I don't know. It would give you like a, a hand injury. So anyhow. Next up is a TI-99 power supply, which is excellent because I do have quite a number of TIs now and yet I have one single brick for all of them. And that's because 
lots of viewers have been generous to send in TI-99s, but they haven't come with the brick. And the one brick I have came from Dave Just Dave. It was a boxed TI that he gave me complete. I think it might have had a set of joysticks, which is probably where I ended up with the first set. Um, but I saw a video on 8-Bit Show and Tell recently, and he mentioned this thing going on. So it's like the plug from the brick goes into this thing, and it's like it's glued in there. And then what you have is this, and then another plug. Power supply part number. I'm assuming this had something to do with compliance, like this is a fuse or something, and they took an old brick, and then they just, uh, they just glued the existing plug into this so you couldn't get it out. Oh, that's in there really, really tightly. How strange. My other brick does not have this. In fact, the other brick I had, instead of a power supply like this, which just outputs AC, it looks like 8.5 volts AC and 18 volts AC. It has two different voltages, two different windings on the transformer. The other one I have, it's a wall wart. So there is actually a plug coming out of this side of the brick and you just plug it straight into the outlet. It doesn't have an extra cable. So that's funny, but it's nice to have an extra power supply now. Okay, we have a TI-99 RF modulator slash RF switch. So what they did is, I think this was a lot like the VIC-20 actually, although the VIC-20 wasn't a single unit. The RF modulator on the VIC-20 is external and so it is on this as well. Power is supplied through the DIN connector and right here there's the components that do the RF modulation. And then this right here is the RF switch to switch between an antenna pass-through and yes, North America back then, we were still using twin lead here at 300 ohm. And this is a 300 ohm to 75 ohm converter. So what I don't quite get is where's the input? I guess, I guess it was this. This is probably like something with twin lead went through there. And it must have connected right there on the PCB. Um, and is this output or input? I don't know. In the box of stuff, there may be the covers. I'll look in a second. We'll just move it off to the side. All right, we have a power supply unit. This is the internal unit of the TI-99. If you're not familiar with it, this is what converts that AC input. And there's four pins there, because remember there was the two voltages into the voltages that the machine needs. Now, if I recall, the TI has 16K of system memory. Uh, well, sort of slow memory. It's video RAM that's actually used as system memory. I guess it's 4116, which means that it needs a couple different voltage rails, like a minus 5 volts, plus 12, and also positive 5. So that's probably what's going on here with these three extra wires. So ground plus those three rails. And actually, now that I think about it, the main processor in that computer also uses 12 volts because remember the repair episode I did where I shorted out the processor by bridging one of the like pins to a via or a trace that was nearby that had 12 volts on it. So it sent 12 volts into the five volt pin and that kind of damaged things. Anyhow, uh, it's nice to have an extra power supply. There's a couple versions of these. Um, there's one that only uses one of the voltage rails that's on the power supply, the external power supply. This one, yep, okay, there's a power LED right here, and this is the power switch for it. So, handy to have an extra one of these. All right, here are the TI motherboards that Foon sent me. Let's take a look at this one. So this one seems pretty standard fare. It's like the earlier revision. There's a later version where the chips have been reorganized a little bit. This is exactly like all the ones I've worked on so far. In fact, uh, the later version that has chips differently arranged has problems running cartridges that aren't original, I think. Like there's some kind of copy protection, so to speak, on them. But this one uh, is the older one, so this has no problems there. So video chip is missing, but that's not a problem. I think I bought a couple off AliExpress for a couple bucks and they actually worked. So that's nice. Um, yeah, main processor, 16-bit processor. That's why it has so many pins. Still can only address 64K of RAM natively. It can do like this fancy 
it's hard to explain how it works. It's, it's actually rather interesting. This chip was really designed for mini computer use, not home computer or micro computers, which is like what these are. Mini computers, sort of like in between mainframes and personal computers. It was like a middle range, it just doesn't really exist anymore. And this was designed for those two computers. So it does support more RAM, but through weird methods. <laughs> So yeah, if you have expansion units and um, the big expansion unit, I guess you can have a lot more memory on the thing, but it's not directly addressed like the standard RAM would be. But the video memory is not connected to the processor directly. It's connected through the video chip at eight bits. So it's really slow, but there is some static RAM, which I think is maybe these two chips or is it these two chips? Uh, maybe it's these two chips. These are static RAM chips that are connected directly to the processor, and they run pretty fast at six, full 16-bit width, 8-bit each. I don't remember the capacity of these chips. It's like 512 bytes, or maybe they're a K or 2K. I think they actually are just 512 bytes. So you get a total of 1K of fast memory on the machine. Uh, it's in the stock configuration um, with this slow memory here. But it's possible to add more RAM to this thing through this side expansion port, and that memory is fast. Anyhow, let's move this off the side and let's look at this next board. Maybe there's a video chip. Nope, there's no video chip on this one either. I can see through the bag. There it is. So this one has a very beautiful looking ceramic package there. I'm just going to straighten out these things a little bit here. The wires are so messy, but that's just the way it is. In fact, this has this, has this extra thicker wire here. Weird, let's uh, compare that to the other board. So the other board has this wire, this wire, has this blue wire here, and there's another blue wire that goes from there to there. This one seems to have all of those wires, but in addition, it has this thick, thick wire here that runs from there to, uh, actually it's clipped there to there. And there are, connection points right there. I can see where that wire is connected there to there. But this must be some kind of an early revision that they needed that. Weird. Yeah, I haven't personally seen that, but I do love this beautiful ceramic package here with the gold pants. That's just super nice looking. Oh, look at this. What is this? Huh. It's like a little piece of metal there, like an RF shielding or something left over. Interesting that this chip here is in a socket and has heat sink compound on it. So obviously they thought that that needed some extra cooling. The ones I've seen only had cooling on the video chip, but this one here, that chip doesn't have a socket and it doesn't have any cooling on it. The chip in question is a TMS 9904 ANL. So it's something to do with the processor. I think this may be like the clock generator. This thing uses weird like multi-phase clock thing going on. I think that is what's generating that. So maybe the early versions needed extra cooling, like they ran really hot, I don't know. The other thing to consider here is that the connector on this one has a, uh, has a connector like this, which is what goes on to the later power supply modules. This, this one here is internal to the computer. So it had like a pin header that this connected to. Unfortunately, the later ones seem to use some kind of interlocking connector, or the earlier ones rather, because this ceramic one here is clearly where this came from. And this interlocks together. So I wouldn't be able to test out this one here unless I, I don't know, kind of jury rig it up somehow. I don't think you can connect these together though. Let's just take a look. Nope, definitely not. Oh, I forgot to show this. There's a cartridge connector here. This goes in the motherboard right here. So when you put the case together, the cartridge slides in like that. It's a passive right angle connector basically. Before I attempt to test these on other boards, Foon sent a floppy disk. And there's a label here, it says, from Foon, disk contains a surprise. Fortunately, this has come off the disk and I can't find the disk. And I'm worried that the disk, because it had no label on it anymore, has gotten mixed in with other disks of mine. 
So I'm just going to spend another moment to look for the disc. Aha! I found it! I also found the covers for the RF switch. So there they are, and I think this is the disc. I'm pretty sure it was another in another box of mail call stuff. So let's see if I can put these on. Although, yeah, RF out. Okay, now I'm reading this on the switch a little bit. This is definitely the input here, this twin lead. But that is the twin lead output. So it would have had something that looked like this with two wires with uh, like kind of spade terminals on the end. And that would have been coming out of there. And for whatever reason, it got pillaged off of this. Interesting. Anyhow, so this switch here, this is the switch that comes through the cover there to go between your TV antenna and the modulator. So this is the TV antenna input coming from your VCR or really just your roof antenna. And then the output is coming out of here and it says that to TV receiver. The weird thing is inside here, there's actually a switch that says off and on. What does that do exactly? That's odd. You can't even access it through this cover. So if I pop this on here and we have a channel select switch down here, three and four. And we have the back cover here, which I might as well just pop on. Will I be connecting a TI to a TV anytime soon? No, no, I won't. <laughs> Basically, that connector, the DIN connector, has video output on it, so I would just use composite. These are very useful, though, if I'm hooking up like a, a VCR to an old TV or something. Anyhow, so here's the disc. Quite sure this is the one. It's kind of the problem with these old labels is they do not stay on. They come off so easily. In fact, look at that. I just put it on and it isn't even staying on. So for testing this disc out, unfortunately, my setup that's normally behind me that I had the 5170 on and all that other stuff, it's still not put back together. So the monitor's not hooked up. I can't even use any of those computers right now. So I'm gonna put this into my Windows 10 machine here. I have a USB floppy drive that sits over here. And let's see what's on that disc. I have to wonder, are floppy drives going to work on Windows 11? <laughs> they seem to be deprecating support for a lot of things. This machine itself, the lab computer here, is way too old to work on Windows 11. So there's no chance of me upgrading this thing. It doesn't even have TPM at all, let alone 2.0. It doesn't support Secure Boot or EFI or any of those things. It's ancient. The motherboard, I think, in there has a BIOS date of 2009. Well, on this disk is an MP4 file, uh, 1.3 meg, so it's like taking up the entire disk. Wonder what this is. Let's see. Let's load up VLC. And we're going to play it right off this floppy disk. I'm not copying it onto the hard drive. 3 minutes, 32 seconds. Let's see how this goes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, I had to mute the audio here because there's a good chance I'd get a copyright strike, but there is actually sound. And as you can see, it's Rick Astley and, uh, oh, it's, it paused me because it's loading off the disc. There we go. Um, we're being Rick rolled basically. And I think a lot of people have mentioned in the past that my little thing here, which is called a TIVO, T-I-V-O-O, uh, in that root, uh, it's a pixel art display, and in the rotation there, I have a little Rickroll action going on. Um, there's an app on your phone. You configure it to load up different things on there. It's actually a Bluetooth speaker as well, um, but I use it as pixel art display mainly. By the way, the video is still playing along here. Um, so yeah, people mention all the time that you get Rickrolled from this thing, <laughs> and it's true. It's on there. Um, there's a link in the description, I think, on to every video to that thing. You can get it off Amazon. They have a whole bunch of other models as well. Um, but he probably wanted to rickroll me back after uh, being rickrolled like so many times on the TiVo. There, there it is. There's Rick Astley dancing away. <laughs> I'm not sure what has worse quality. That thing with the LEDs or the extreme MPEG-4 compression. Um, on the floppy disk. 
Oh, it's so funny. It's so funny. I actually like Rick Astley when I was back in the 80s. I was totally listening to his stuff. And uh, yeah, you know what's really funny too is if you go look at this video on YouTube, look at how many views it has. So, so many. Like the amount of money he's made off this video because people keep sending it around. I don't think he cares one bit that, you know, Rickroll is like some kind of a bad thing because every play on YouTube totally makes him money. He probably makes more off YouTube or he did for a while than any all, all his other royalties combined, which is amazing. I think I might have VLC on repeat. No, I don't actually. So I've just been talking away as it, as it plays. <laughs> so uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Rick Astley. <laughs> That is funny, very funny. Okay, so where on earth did I put my video chips for these things? You know, it's getting to the point where I'm starting to lose track of things a little bit down the basement. I have this big pile of chips over on my right side here. And for a long time, they were floating around over there because I had them in little bags, but then I made a video where I tested them and then they worked and now I don't know where I put them. So. I know I have a bunch of TI parts all together. I'm gonna go find that and hopefully that's got what I need in it. All right, success. Found the video chip here. TMS 9918. I'm pretty sure this will be the one from China. It's got a tick mark on it. So that is definitely one that I signed off on, so to speak, after testing it. Okay, in that box of parts, there were speech modules that someone sent me in the past. It might have been Foon, actually, who sent those to me, plus key switches and other goodies. But I couldn't find the other power supply. I think my spare power supply that would power up this board is in one of my TI-99 parts machines. So I will have to go dig that out to be able to test this board here. All right, I'm back. Bad news. The parts machines are kind of in an inaccessible spot right now, not without moving a ton of stuff out of the way. And yeah, I'm doing some reorganization right now in the basement, especially up in my crawl space. And that's where I have to store some stuff. And when it's in the state it's in right now, it's really hard to get to stuff. I can get to my one good, fully assembled, really nice condition TI, the silver one. I don't feel like taking that thing apart. Um, the parts machines are are ready, you know, are loose and easy to take apart, but the good machine is fully assembled and it's a bit involved taking it apart. So I'm probably just gonna try to connect these up together, figure out a way to do that. Like maybe I'll depin this or something. Gosh, I don't wanna do that. That's dangerous because they didn't even use different color wires. Like really, TI, really? All right, anyways, enough complaining from me. Let's move this one out of the way here and we'll focus on this old board first. So we took a look at it before, all looks good. There's some bent pins here. So let me just grab some needle nose to try to fix these. Just get these straight again. This is the keyboard connector. You know, I just thinking without my parts machine, I don't have a good keyboard and you can't really test these. Well, you can test them to see if they power on but you can't even push a key to get them into basic or anything. But I assume if it gets that far, it's probably working. So I'm just giving this thing a quick once over, make sure nothing looks completely out of the ordinary. I'm pretty sure I have a broken TI-99 already. One of the parts machines doesn't work, or one or more of them doesn't work. It's a good chance I'm gonna have to just do a repair-a-thon anyways. So if this, this board doesn't work, then let's do a repair -thon. And you know what, I can include the other one, which is untested. I'll just mark it as such. Well, okay, the first thing I'm gonna do is plug this into the power without the video chip in it. So I'll keep that video chip out. I know that chip does work. Well, let's plug this in. I don't even know if this is on or off right now. Well, we'll find out momentarily. That's on. Now what I wanted to do is check some of the voltage rails. So let's break out the multimeter. I just turned it off, by the way. I heard the buzzing of the power supply. All right, so I don't even know which one I'm on here, but let's see. Okay, 11.9, um, well, negative 11.9, but I'm pretty sure I had those leads reversed. 
All right, on this TTL chip here, we're getting 5.17. That is a little high, actually. Let me turn that off. Does this have any kind of adjustments on it? It certainly does not. Not much you can do on here. This power supply is pretty simplistic. This large heatsink is connected to a 7812. This one here is a 7905. So that's a minus five volt rail voltage regulator. And I assume this one here is the five volt regulator. And it's just, it's just running a little, a little hot. Although there's some ICs on here. So maybe that's, I can't read the part number on this. Maybe that's a little bit more sophisticated than just a, a regular regulator. It probably is actually, because this doesn't get that hot. So it's doing regular linear regulation for the 12 volts and the minus five, but the five volts a little more fancy. So here is the video chip. Look at it again with the rebadging from China, but it works and I doubt they're counterfeit because who would counterfeit that? Um, the thing that's really confusing me is this socket shows the notch at the top, but every other chip that's oriented north south like this has the notch at the bottom. So I'm going to, I don't know, I just don't trust that this socket is in the right way. There's as is typical with TI when they made this thing, there is no silkscreen markings at all. That is incredibly frustrating to me. This was my complaint when I did the first repair on this machine. Nothing is labeled, no components, nothing at all. So I'm gonna go find a picture of this machine and I'm gonna verify the chip orientation from the photograph. Well, so far the pictures I'm seeing it does go with the notch down in the same orientation as everything else on the motherboard. Let me find a couple other pictures just to double check, but how ridiculous, the socket is in backwards. All right, after looking at a few more pictures, the chip definitely goes with the notch this direction. So this socket right here is in backwards. The notch is right there and it should be down there. And just for double checking, I have this other motherboard here. This one doesn't even have a notch, but what it does have is a dot right there. That notch indicates pin one. And that means the notch should be right there on the south side of the board. That is ridiculous. Ridiculous. I am going to use this white marker here, and I am just going to mark this with a little dot of white paint. TI can really suck it with the design of this thing. I gotta say, it's just so ridiculous. Okay, and I'm gonna use the VIC-20 cable here, which I'm pretty sure is the right deal for hooking that up to the monitor. All right, and I have the retro tank connected to this cable. The speaker is also connected. Let's get some color bars just to make sure we have the right input. There it is. All right, here we go. Oh, look at that, it's working, but it's very screwy looking. Could this just be a bad connection? Hmm, I'm almost thinking that this is like some kind of a RAM issue, something like that. Yeah, the speaker down. Let's turn this off and on, let's hear if we, let's hear, if we hear sound. Okay, th that's it, totally normal beep, but <laughs> now it even looks more screwed up. Uh, you know what? Let's do a little deoxid action on this socket. I think it's been a little bit of time since I've deoxided something to try to fix it. I mean, it's possible that this chip has died as well. I mean, I don't know. It worked when I tested it. You know, I got to deal with this deoxid can. This top is so crappy. It leaks everywhere. It just drips. Ugh. Okay, let's try this again. Here we go again. Come on, retro tank. Very slow sometimes. Well, no, still looks screwy. Sorry for not capturing the screen, but you know, we're getting some garbage lettering here. Like it says, you know, Texas Instruments, but instead of an X, we have a P. And instead of a, an I, there's an A. So definitely there are some RAM issues going on uh, with some of the bits being bad. 
it's amazing the computer is working as much as it is, but it could be that the the RAM, the static RAM, is all you need to get to this point for booting. But the characters being screwy are, are definitely problematic, and I'm you know I'm sure the color and stuff is probably stored in there as well. Uh, let's just try this one more time. We'll see if it gets that other random pattern. No, it's similar. <laughs> Funny, a sideways exclamation point there. And pushing on the graphics chip doesn't change anything. Let's check for really hot chips here. Nothing out of the ordinary. What I'm going to do is I'm going to write down a couple of the bit errors that I see here. So for instance, begin instead of the I. So all the I's on here are showing up as A's. And then the N is showing up as an F. And the X is showing up as a P. Showing up as an E. And so the M is an E and then the N is an F. So it's like one of the bits is bad. We'll look at that in a second. Looks like the O for computer is showing up as a G. Oh yeah, it looks like a Y is showing up as Q. Oops, Q. Because it says press any key. Oh yeah, the K, it's another one that we can, we can decode. K is showing up as a C. Yeah, press any key to begin. <laughs> I'm just trying to remember how that screen looks. Anyhow, we're not going to do a repair here, but I'm just going to put this as a bit error here. And this will tell us right away by looking at the schematics exactly which of these chips is bad. And that's because it's almost certainly one bit that's, say, stuck on all the time, or maybe stuck off all the time. It's probably stuck off all the time, which is why uh, the letter becomes a lower letter. So if you think about ASCII characters, A is at the beginning, you know, through Z is at the top. So because the I becomes an A, it's like going backwards, right? N is an F, X is going to P. So one of the bits is stuck at zero, which automatically reduces every letter to a previous letter, you know, further back down the ASCII chart. And with just a quick Google, you can find an ASCII chart that shows what everything is in binary. So there's A, which is basically 0, 1, all zeros, and then a 1. And from our little chart here, the I was becoming an A. Now that implies right there that bit number 3 is the problem. So starting from the right, it's 0, bit 0, bit 1, bit 2, bit 3, all the way through bit 7. Well, I is going to become A. And if we look at like the letter J, um, with that bit that goes wrong, J would become B, for instance. Let's just check another one here. So we have X. Now let's just look at X. So there is X. And we know that that bit is problematic. So the letter we're going to look for that it's going to turn into is going to be 01010000. And I think that was P, right? Yep. 01010000. So right away that's telling us that whatever chip on this motherboard is bit number three is bad and is stuck at zero. Now, it could also be that the video chip is bad too. So I guess, I don't know, I should get the parts machine out for the repair-a-thon and try this chip just to make sure it still works. But I'm going to say right on here that bit number three stuck at zero. And on the schematics, it will be trivial to see which is bit number three, data bit number three on the video chip, and which of these chips is that one. And that would be the one to swap out. And I'm going to grab this other one here, and I'm just going to stick a note on here to say, untested, no PSU. So there we have it. Lots of TI-99 stuff from Foon. Pretty awesome. There's going to have to be a repair-a-thon for TIs. Of course, I've been saying that a lot lately because there's at least a Commodore 64 repair-a-thon, and then I have that big, massive Atari repair-a-thon slash test-a-thon from all that stuff that Stuart sent in, and then now the TI-99 one. But repair-a-thons are fun. I think people enjoy them, so yeah, I'm looking forward to that. So thanks again, Foon, for sending in all this cool TI stuff, and I'll be very curious to see if this board works and then see if I can get this one working by just 
swapping out that bad chip. All right, that's going to be it for this mail call episode. The worst joysticks ever made. If you know of a worse joystick than these, please let me know in the comment section because I really don't think they there were any that were commercially sold and not by some horrible third party, but by a first party company. Yeah, I mean, the button, the button is so bad. Anyhow, I hope you enjoyed that video. Thanks to Foon for sending in the TI stuff. Look for a future repair video on that. And of course, thanks to all my patrons who have been supporting me. Uh, their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. I think it's the right or left. I always point to the wrong side, so I'm not gonna bother pointing anymore. And, uh, but thanks again to the patrons. And if you wanna become a patron, there's a link in the description below. You'll get early access to videos and it's much easier to contact me through Patreon than through email, for instance, stuff like that. And I guess if you like this video, thumbs up. If you didn't, you know what to do. And oh, don't forget to check out my second channel. Lots of cool stuff on there. In fact, I kind of post follow-up videos to stuff on the main channel. So sometimes I'm working on a bigger project and there's like little things I wanna follow up on or little side tangents or whatever that are related and I'll post them on the second channel. So it's kind of cool, get subscribed, yeah. Anyhow, that's it. So thanks for watching, stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.